upgrading uh, and trying to keep these guys uh, under some type of control. Um, so we're really pleased to be back here, and I want to thank Bill Munson and Andy Major from the Bills and uh, give our sincere regards and gratefulness uh, to Mr. Wilson, who has uh, provided such incredible leadership to the Buffalo community, to the Bills, and such great friendship uh, to my dad and to my mother. So thank you, and Mort, we'll turn it over to you. Uh, I don't even know if I can keep myself down. <laughs> This is all over with. Just I want to make an announcement. Eddie Rakowski would like to have everybody come to his house for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Lou went home to cook. <laughs> Tell me when we're rolling. Did you mention that people should talk to you and each other and not to the camera? Uh, no. Okay, yeah. Do not address yeah. the camera. Okay, no. so, um, did you hear that? Don't, don't look at the camera, look at me or look at each other when you talk. Okay. I don't know why, but that's it. <laughs> you better look at you, Mort. You better put some more makeup on. <laughs> Small technical issue, no foul. <laughs> they don't use film. So this is all digital. Yeah. Digits aren't working. Oh. <clears throat> How does it feel to be retired now? Good. Got a lot of time, right? Absolutely. Do you need to test mic? And when he says something, he doesn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's picking on the mic. No, no. Test him, test him. You're a rose between two thorns, Sal. So. The only guy. But he, he'd break it. Rose between two thorns. That's how we got OJ, right? Yeah, missed it by a yard, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you should have had the ball off instead of trying to run it. There you go, baby. In fact, Eddie's responsible for everything OJ's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> how, are we, how are we doing? Take a look. Take a look. 
<laughs> we just didn't start yet, though. Know. Oh, you didn't go over to Hutch Tech today, right? As you remember the show, Candy Camera, this is it. This is it. <laughs> is Mort <laughs> Ellen Funt? Yeah, he looks like Oh, yeah. Eddie. Al said the camera's not on. It's retirement time. Okay, we're tired of more. Can we have Brian? Short Brian? Yeah, yeah, mine. Shorter Brian. Mort hasn't asked anything yet. I go into the convention. Oh, yeah. You guys got going. Did they, so did they get the first? Uh, that's all set. So the first, that's all set. Probably Marlow. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll go. Like, when well, every time you talk. Just move your lips. <laughs> yeah, look, Paul talk on your behalf. Oh. <laughs> In the makeup room, he asked me to keep the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I do when this is over. Oh, you see, I'm the one. Edward Berg and Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> she, won't, she won't recognize him when he gets to the. I'm sure that school. You did? He's shouting. They told me I'm sorry. Can you imagine eight oh, years of this no with McGuire? Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 That, was, that was something. I mean, you can go to Williamsville. Yeah, from the time we came here. I think Paul oh. came with me. Uh, sixty-three. Yeah, you came what? Sixty-two. Uh, Booker was sixty-two. I think Ed was 63. Paul, 63 or 64? So the people who were here, I thought Paul the people who were here, the Blair. Were Jack, you two, and Al. I, didn't Chance, do it. I know Chance. you didn't do it. Yeah. Chance, I you were here. No, I came. Uh, he's a tall man. Jack, Jack, Jack first year was 62, right? Yeah. 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 I came 63. Okay. I think, oh, Paul, you were 63, oh, 63, right? Four. 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 That's what I thought. Oh, I thought Paul was with me. I was with Jack in 61. In San Diego. When did he come here? So it's, 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 Booker, Ernie, it's Booker, Ernie, and Al were here before, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I was here before. Your last game with the Chargers was the blowout over Patriots, right? Over the Patriots. On the championship. Yeah. 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 That's what right. they beat I, us I still here. think the greatest game that I, in the 11 years that I played was, was the 65 championship game where he was, Jack was the most valuable player. Yeah. yeah. When shut shut him out, they had all worked. We beat him, 23 oh, nothing. Yeah. Right. I was in San Diego. In San Diego. In San Diego. Yeah, Faison, right. Lance. Right. Philly got hurt, too. Yeah, Another, I Flynn come in. Flynn, yeah. George Flynn. He got into the butt. Lincoln. I'm living there. Yeah. I just can't, I just can't help it. With the Sestak and Dunaway and Tippi. They told us sitting on the bench. And then we got to win this football game. It's four guys. In unison. Win. They're not going to score. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and they even played him up. Who was the other center that they brought in when Philly got hurt? I went over and played his. And he brought another center. Ready? Okay. Everybody. Dave Bearman. Okay. Dave Bearman. Who? Dave Bearman. Bearman was in traction. I'm Morton Kondraki. Uh, we're here at the Ralph Wilson Stadium in Buffalo uh, to do a day of oral history interviews uh, on the career of Jack Kemp, the Bills star quarterback for eight years and the Buffalo area congressman for 18 years. 
Uh, this event is sponsored by the Bills Organization and the Jack Kemp Foundation as part of the Jack Kemp Legacy Project. Thank you all for being here. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Would you please introduce yourselves briefly, um, say who you are and what your role with the team was and what years you were there, uh, starting with, um, with Ed Ebermoski. I'm Ed Ed Ebermoski. I was the trainer from 1960 to 1997, uh, so uh, I know Jack quite well. Larry. I'm Larry Felser. I covered the Bills from the start, from their start, uh, from 1960 uh, up to the present, present for Buffalo newspapers. Al. I'm Al B. Miller. Uh, I came here in 1961, played till 69. I was the center and also played uh, guard and tackle for the, the Bills. Charlie. Charlie Ferguson. I was a wide receiver. Uh, from 1963 to 1969. Paul McGuire, uh, I was Jack Kemp's favorite punter and the only guy that on the Buffalo Bills football team that he really liked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ernie Warlick, I was the tight end for the Bills uh, beginning in 1962 to 1965 uh, and was Jack's favorite tight end. <laughs> Booker. <laughs> I'm Booker Edgerson, cornerback 1962 through 1969, and just a great fan of Jack Kemp. Great. Ed. Edward Kasky, I played from 63 to uh, 68. I was a uh, wide receiver, a quarterback, and it was my fumble against Oakland that got us the number one draft choice in 1969, O.J. Simpson. And if Ralph Wilson's watching this, Ralph, you owe me a finder's fee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask all of you this question, and we'll just go in, uh, in reverse order, starting with Edward Kowski. Um, when you think about Jack Kemp, what, what favorite thoughts come to mind, um, and uh, does one particular experience stand out to you on or off the field? Uh, this gives you an opportunity to just tell your favorite story. Ed? I've got a lot of favorite stories about yeah. Jack Kemp. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the year that I played uh, quarterback, uh, Jack had injured his uh, knee, tore it up in a preseason uh, uh, practice, and I ended up the last uh, uh, part of the season as starting quarterback. And Jack uh, would be on the sidelines or up in the press box, uh, and when I came off the field, he would tell me what I was doing wrong and maybe uh, some potential plays I should call. And, and the first time that I ever went in as quarterback, I think it was against the uh, Houston Oilers, and Jack was on the sidelines sitting on the bench with his leg po uh, propped up in a cast, and I think I threw like five passes and three were incomplete and two were intercepted. And as I came off the field, I came off the field to almost like a standing ovation. And I walked over the bench to sit next to Jack and he was shaking his head. And he said, Eddie, if only I was Polish and Catholic and went to Notre Dame. He said, it's uh, unbelievable. I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant from California. He just couldn't believe it. Booker. Well, one of my favorite... Uh, Conversations with Jack is uh, when he first came here. Um, he came here injured with his finger, and and, and there was so much uh, fuss and what to do about uh, getting Jack Camp off the waiver wires, and that Buffalo had the, the greatest, one of the greatest quarterbacks in, in American Football League at that particular time, and that how Lou Saban uh, manipulated the system and got Jack in here. And I remember talking to Jack, um, and not knowing Jack at, at any point. Uh, to me, uh, at, the, at that time, he started talking, you know, with his proper talk and everything, and, and <laughs> that he went to, uh, uh, came from California, went to Occidental, and, 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 and all those things, you know, and I'm saying, what, what is this guy coming from? Because he was so prop and pompous, and I said, how could he quarterback us to any kind of wins, you know, and why did Lou Saban pick this guy up off of the, the waiver wire? And later on, as, as the season went on, yeah, the, the proof was in the pudding that Jack did prove to be the quarterback that we needed to, to put us on the map here in Buffalo. Great. Mm. Okay, Ernie? Uh, one thing that I remember distinctly is uh, Jack used to love to throw the hook pattern to the tight end, where the, the, that means, for those that don't know, you go down, you, you run your pattern about 8 to 10 yards, and then just make a turn and face the quarterback. Well, my fingers 
it took a long time for my fingers to <laughs> get any feeling back, and also my chest, because he threw a ball that was so hard that he must have been about 20 or 30 miles an hour. And he said, Ernie, hook up. And I said, do I have to? <laughs> because he could really fire the ball. Yeah, right. You know, I just listened to Booker, and it just reminded me of Jack. I met him in 1960 with the Los Angeles Chargers. And Jack went to Occidental, and, it, you know, I don't know if anybody had ever learned anything going to Occidental, but <laughs> Jack, people really didn't realize that this guy is really self-taught. Every day that I knew him in, in California in a couple of years, he'd practice a new word, and he'd use it in a sentence. And when he got here, everybody thought he was so damn smart. Well, I mean, he just... <laughs> so one day... He came up to me, and you know, I never really knew how to take him because he didn't go out with the guys, and he didn't drink, and all these things. And I used to go out once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so he said to me at, at practice one day, I said, "Jack, how's it going?" He said, "You know, Paul," he said, "I really like your perspicacity." Now I didn't know whether to punch it there <laughs> or thank it, and then, you know, I, but he smiled, so I figured it was good. Mm -hmm. I was going to look it up to see what it meant, and. Fifty years later, I still haven't looked it up because I can't spell it. <laughs> but this guy really was self-taught, and I and I tell you something: you talk about a leader. Look at what he did after football. Not only what he did in football, he was a great leader. Yep. You know, my first experience with Jack uh, coming here, and uh, I was on the bench. I just played coming into my first game with Jack, and. About the last uh, 20 seconds of the game, we were playing the Patriots, and we were behind. And Coach uh, Saban and uh, John Mazur said, uh, Ferg, we want to put you in and uh, run a post and run like hell. <laughs> so uh, Jack looked at me, and Jack said, you ready? I said, yeah. So I go out and ran like hell, <laughs> and Jack threw the ball, and it was there. And I caught the pass. and. Uh, it was an 80-yard touchdown pass. We won the game. And right, Jack had been catching hell throughout that game. He did not have a good night. So Jack came over to me and he said, Fergie, Fergie, if you hadn't caught that pass, both of them had been run out of here. You know, both of them been, they would have ran us but out of here, you know. So uh, that was my first experience with Jack, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, working with Jack. Yep. Well, my uh, experience with uh, Jack Camp, at, at those, uh, in those years, uh, most of the time, the, uh, well, all the time, the center's uh, position was that the quarterback was always up underneath of you with, with his hands up underneath of you. <laughs> and, uh, and I found out through the years that uh, of all the people that were, you know, up underneath of me, uh, he had two things there. He had, one, he had very soft hands, <laughs> and second of all, his hands were always warm. <laughs> so uh, that's what I en enjoyed about him. And, uh, <laughs> and then I found out later that he was going into uh, when he was going into. Uh, 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 be a politician and everything, and I, I always told him, many all my friends, I says, you know, he's, I think he'll make a good one, one of the honest ones, I, he says, because uh, uh, he never uh, did anything wrong to me, <laughs> you know, they, and, I, and I think he's a man that you can trust. <laughs> so that's what I remember of Jack Kemp. <laughs> okay, Larry. <laughs> my lasting uh, memory of Jack as a football player was his first game in Buffalo after he came off the injured list in, in that 1962 season. Uh, the, the Bills had lost their first seven games of the season that year, and it looked like a terrible disaster. But Kemp had started the week before uh, in Oakland. He was rusty because he had just, you know, he had, he had just recovered from a very serious uh, hand injury. And the, the Bills won that game 10 to 6. Now they get into Buffalo, uh, his showcase game. They, uh, against the team that had beaten them really badly in Dallas, the Dallas Texans, which are now the Kansas City Chiefs now. Kemp had a fantastic day that day, threw for. Uh, 
tremendous amount of yardage. Bills won, and uh, against the team that would end, end up winning the uh, AFL championship. And when it was over, uh, the crowd was that day was a record crowd, more than 35,000 people. Record crowd for, a, for the AFL team. And um, uh, when it was over, the fans swarmed the field, hundreds, maybe a couple thousand. And they were, they were going wild. And they picked him up on their shoulders and they were carried to, into the dressing room. They were probably mostly Democrats. But uh, uh, once and for all, he was their hero and their leader. And uh, it was a remarkable uh, thing he did it for Buffalo at the time. Yeah. Uh, Paul McGuire, uh, you uh, were with him in San Diego or in, in Los Angeles before he came uh, to, uh, uh, to Buffalo. So w was there any difference in the, in the camp style under S Sid Gilman? Uh, with the Chargers and uh, Larry Saban with the, uh, um, uh, Lou Saban with the um, um, Bills? Yeah, I think, what, I think Jack learned all of his football from Sid Gilman. He really did. Uh, Sid Gilman, you did what he told you to do. Uh, when he came here, he taught Lou Saban all of his football. <laughs> 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 but I, I just have, I have to tell you that in 1960, I came out of college, I'm only 21 years old, and I was scared to death. We went out on the, on the practice field, and Jack is there. And uh, I didn't know who he was, and you know nobody. We didn't know each other, so I walked out, and I'm, I'm walking on the field. I'm, I'm listening to this guy calling signals, and I'm hearing down seven. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> so I said, "Who is that?" The guy says, "That's Jack Kemp. He's our quarterback." And I said, "Then someone ought to check him for testicles." <laughs> 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 Al, um, um, I forgot to, um, um, Eddie, Eddie, I'm sorry, Eddie Evermowski, I forgot to let you give us your favorite Kemp story. Okay, I, I, I knew Jack when he uh, was with the Lions. Uh, he got uh, drafted by the Detroit Lions, and I was, a, I was a trainer at the University of Detroit, and I was a game day trainer for the Lions because the trainer for the Lions was a Purdue grad as I was, and so we did things together, so I worked there. But anyway, uh, I remember Jack playing with the thing, and the, the, all the, 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 the Lions player used to say, the only reason Buddy Parker, who was the coach of, uh, of uh, uh, right. the Lions, kept Jack is because Buddy was from Kemp, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had a, 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 a soft spot for Jack. But anyway, there's two other things about Jack that, uh, uh, from my standpoint, Number one, when he had this serious finger injury, he made sure the ball would fit. It was fused and make sure the ball would fit on the, on the football so he could throw it. And the second thing was Jack was one of the first players to lift weights. And in them days, it was taboo for a pitcher or a quarterback or anybody to lift weights. And Jack, as it, the guys attested, he could throw the ball through a brick wall. Mm -hmm. he, he could throw it 80 yards. He was fantastic. So now you see what goes on about with the uh, weight training with the players and stuff. So that's my... Yeah. Right. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, Ernie Warlick, um, you were here as well before Jack arrived. So what, when you heard that Jack Kemp had been uh, uh, um, obtained on waivers for $100 and was coming from the Chargers, I mean, what, what did you think that this was going to do to the team? What was his reputation as a, as a quarterback? Well, first of all, I had run into Jack uh, in Canada. I came here from the Canadian Football League, and uh, Jack was there. He threw the ball too hard <laughs> in Canada uh, because the quarterback was, and most of the quarterbacks in the Canadian League were running as well as passing. So when I got here, uh, when I got to Buffalo in 1962, uh, sh shortly after uh, one or two practices, uh, there was Jack Kemp, and uh, I thought it would be it would it would, it would be good that uh, that Jack would do something for our team. Of course, I was just trying to make it myself. You know, I just uh, switched from the Canadian League to uh, the Buffalo Bills. So uh, 
I forgot your question. What was your <laughs> question? <laughs> no, I wondered, well, I mean, did everybody think that, you know, that this guy was a great quarterback uh, for, the, for the Chargers and he's going to make our team? Or what was, the, what was that everybody's Well, you're attitude? probably asking the wrong guy because I was new also. Mm -hmm. I was just coming in and uh, into the States having played in Canada. So I was trying to feel my way around as well. But I can say this, I'm very pleased that uh, Jack came to the Bills because he could really fire that ball. And uh, fortunately, I had a big hand, so I could <laughs> catch it. And I think playing with him helped me uh, stabilize my career with the Bills. Uh, Anybody else want to comment on, on what, what, what the town expected when, when he arrived? Okay. You. Well, uh, I don't know what the town expected because, uh, like I said earlier, is that uh, Jack, to me, his name wasn't a great name, but I knew where he came from based on a lot of uh, the press that he got coming in here because I was a defensive back, and I really could care less about what the offense did mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I'm, I was always defended against mm -hmm. the offense. So um, when, when Jack came in, uh, the impression was is that he was the savior for the Buffalo Bills, um, what I learned later on is, is that not only that he was a savior, you know, notwithstanding saying that Cookie Gilchrist was basically uh, the savior as well, but uh, Jack lent a, a lot of, of credibility to, to the offensive football team because uh, the defense was the, was the catalyst of the team at that point. Um, we had some great guys at defense, and, but Jack's uh, quarterback leadership skills, as Paul McGuire pointed out, uh, you know, he talked to people, uh, he encouraged individuals to do things, he kept you on the right track, uh, great leader, and uh, I, I think that that put us on the map, uh, bringing us from uh, a 500 team to a championship team for two years in a row. Mark, you know, one of the things that uh, I was with char the Chargers in 62 when Jack got cut, and Sid Gilman got rid of him because he, he had, had broken his finger and he just couldn't play. And, and in those days, there were only 32 guys on the team. You either played or you got the hell out of town. It was that simple. But Eddie was alluding to it. Uh, when he had the operation for his finger, I, it, it wasn't, uh, he went in to the operating room with Dr. Uh, Godfrey. Is that right, Eddie? And he, he took the football in. So what they did is they fused his finger around on the, you know, they put, put his hand on the ball and then fused the finger so that he could grip the ball and throw it. You talk about, you know, somebody that knows for the rest of his life he's going to walk around. I mean, it's a great finger to have straight, but <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of your life, I mean, you got, you got that, baby. But here's the guy, just he wanted to play. That's the character of Jack Kemp. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Al. Well, I know one thing about Jack Kemp. He, uh, he inspired me with his uh, warm and... Uh, <laughs> What? <laughs> With his warm hands. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't used to that. I, I excuse me. I played quarterback the last half. I mean, how were Yours my hands? wasn't as good. Oh. <laughs> you know, I'd so, just like to add, Warren, yeah. before you go. Yeah. Uh, I noticed when I first came here, and uh, I was not used to Jack. Jack was not used to me, and we had tremendous wide receivers here: Elba Dubinian, Glenn Bass, Ed was there, and then myself. And uh, the one thing that uh, I gained a lot of confidence with Jack is that he was willing to work after practice. Jack worked, uh, spent a lot of time with us for timing. And uh, I thought that was extremely important. And I thought uh, with a slant pattern, uh, I thought I was just invisible. Nobody could cover me. And also on a post pattern. And Jack would love to throw those patterns, and uh, his timing became so great in working with the receivers. And uh, of course, I just gained so much confidence in uh, experiencing that with Jack. So he, had, at that I, time. I take it uh, that the answer is that he had a great work ethic. He did. Yeah, yes. extremely uh, good. Um, yeah. And um, uh, Ed Abramowski, was was he tough? I mean, did he want to play when he was hurt? Oh yeah, I mean. Just like Paul said, uh, uh, he 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 would would play with all the all the little bruises, and you know he'd get uh, sacked or, or, or smashed by a player, and he'd uh, 
always take his time, pretend he was tie his shoelace or something to catch his breath uh, in there so they wouldn't know he was hurt. And uh, he, he, he uh, <coughs> exemplified the, 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 the toughness. Did he have a lot of shots? Did you give him a lot of shots? No. <laughs> no, no. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you didn't. But I'll tell you what, I, I was in Houston, Texas, and I went in the training room to get, I don't know what to get, some bennies or something. But I went in the training room and opened the door, and Dr. Uh, Godfrey is sticking a needle in Jack's shoulder so that he can get his arm up the throat. His throwing shoulder. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'm, I, I almost got sick. I mean, is that good though? Maybe I should get some of those. <laughs> I, no, I, but I, it, it was the first time I walked in. And I said, "What the hell are you doing?" He had to do that almost for every practice, just to go out and practice. The guy was tough. In, in, in today's game, uh, they tell a quarterback, "Your two best friends are the uh, turf and the sideline. You don't ever want to get hit." But when Jack would roll out after a, a play action fake. And he would turn uh, upfield and take on a uh, linebacker, put his head down. And uh, how many times we saw him get knocked out and carried off the field <laughs> after the one game? Uh, the next day in the paper, and Jack always uh, had a cute story about it. The Buffalo News had headlines: Kemp suffers concussion. Uh, and the sub-headline was, x-rays of head reveal nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he always used that as a, as a cute story. <laughs> uh, one, one other thing that I remember is uh, on some occasions, Kent would call a quarterback sneak when we only needed maybe a half yard to gain the first down. And which with a quarterback sneak, that means the quarterback would keep the ball and run. Yeah. Well... Uh, there were a couple of occasions I remember that uh, Cookie, weighing 240, would hit Kemp from the rear to knock him <laughs> forward to get that half yard or whatever. And I remember a couple of times uh, after the play, uh, Jack got up off, uh, from the ground and said, nice play, Cookie. <laughs> nice going, <laughs> Cookie. He almost broke his back. <laughs> well, you know who was in front of him, Ernie? You. Uh, <laughs> I got a few of those, too. You did. But you know, Mort, there was a thing, you know, about Jack and, and uh, you know, he was into politics and all these things. But the one thing, we had a team party on Tuesday nights at, at downtown, uh, Mr., a place called Mr. Oh, Anthony's. Nice. And, you know, it was upstairs, we had a meeting room, and, and it was kind of neat. In those years, we were winning, and we'd get after, we'd look at the film, and that night, all the guys would get together, and then we'd kind of separate, and they'd go over. You know, you, did, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Jack never missed coming to one of those parties. He didn't drink, but he was there to represent the team, to be with us. And Jack, you know, above all the things, that, you know, his political career and all this, Jack was a team player, really and truly a team player. And the one thing in his mind that you remember that every one of these guys will remember forever and the guys that played with him, there's nobody that wanted to win more than Jack Kemp did. One of the things was that what Paul said about Jack coming to those meetings. Jack, you know, as he said how smart Jack was, you know, Jack was laying the foundation for his political career to make sure that we voted for him, supported <laughs> him. That's what he was doing. So did he, uh, was he um, the kind of quarterback who would rally you? I mean, if, if you were down and losing or something? I mean, did, did he encourage everybody to make speeches? Or what did he, he say? He, he, he did it on the field. I recall the one game we were playing, uh, I think it was against uh, Houston Oilers. Uh, we, we were uh, three and out in the first three series. And uh, uh, the fourth time we went on the field, the fans started booing us. And Jack got out and he said, hey, let's, let's shut him up. And he threw a 93-yard touchdown pass to Albert Dominion and came off the field to Nice standing ovation. So uh, he did it on the field. He didn't have to do it in the huddle. Jack was also the second guy since Sammy Baugh. That, that, that picture behind Eddie, the, the jump pass. Yeah. People don't understand that. I mean, you've always seen him, you know, in, in film and, and, and speakers behind tables. Jack was only five four. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to really jump and throw the ball over. Well, I'll tell him about his famous figure eights where he'd lose 30 yards when he'd go back to <laughs> Pass he, 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 was, he was a scrambler. Yes. Yeah. And he, yeah, he, 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 he was the he, only he used to do yeah. this big figure eight, and he'd, he'd, he'd 
go back and he'd be back 30 yards from the line of scrimmage and he'd complete the pass and it'd be a two-yard gain. <laughs> he he was him. a scrambling quarterback but, with absolutely no speed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I'd just yeah, like to yeah. say, uh, add on, and Booker, uh, we were getting ready for the championship game, 6-5 to five in San Diego. And uh, we had the two buses. And the first bus, uh, most of the guys that like to get there early always try to get on the first bus. And Jack was on the first bus, Booker, myself, I'm not sure, Paul. And, no. uh, but anyway, going to the stadium, I mean, it was so quiet, you can hear a pen drop. And everybody was just really uh, getting ready mentally for the game. And I guess about halfway to the stadium, the old uh, Balboa Stadium, and it was just so quiet in there. And Booker said, Jack Kemp, you SOB, you better have a hot hand out there today. <laughs> <laughs> and when that happened, it just, everybody just started laughing. It broke the tension. And I think that really had a strong impact on Jack, how he played that game uh, that Sunday, because it was just unbelievable. Jack could do no wrong. The defense, like Paul alluded to, played the exceptional game. And uh, we just shut them out. They couldn't do anything. So, and, uh, so Paul, was he fun to be around? I mean, you're you're oh, no. you're the <laughs> hell no. You're one of the funniest people I ever met. So. <laughs> no, I I never liked being around him. I, I mean, Joanne, his his wife, wonderful woman. I mean, really good friends to everybody. And but no, yeah, yeah he was. you know, he he was the kind of guy that you know you would talk to, and but then it would always revert to politics or something yeah. was going on, and you know. I don't care, man. You know, he didn't sit with us and drink a beer, but he sat with us. No, he was very boring as well. <laughs> well, when we went on, uh, we'd go on these trips, you know, five for any distance, an hour, two hours, three hours, and then uh, most of us had our playbooks with us, and we were studying our plays, you know, so we knew what we were doing. He was there. <laughs> He was there reading a political book or something. Oh, yeah. And that, he never he never got into the... Yeah. So, no, when, did, so when did he read his playbook? I have no idea. He was, uh, <laughs> he was a smart individual. I guess he must have looked through it, and that was it. So. The question is, when did you read your playbook? <laughs> I didn't have to. I just fell down. <laughs> Give him the ball and fall down. That, that's true, because we had training camp up at Niagara University, and after our uh, evening meal, uh, you know, a lot of the guys went out... Uh, Whatever they did up there, Paul, go on, had a couple beers. Uh, but Jack said, uh, you know, let's go out and do something. So I'd go with him, and they'd take me down to the uh, B&B bookstore in downtown Niagara Falls, and uh, get the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. News and World <laughs> Report, and start doing all this stuff. And, and you talk about uh, uh, on the road. And I lived in Hamburg, and Jack lived in Hamburg, and we would drive to and from practice. And I would always be talking about the game plan, and Jack would start talking about politics, and, you know, where were you born, or are you a Republican or a Democrat? I said, I'm a Democrat. He said, how can you be a Democrat? Yeah. And he started uh, indoctrinating me about Republicanism, and, and then we used to go on the uh, uh, West Coast trip. We didn't fly out to the West Coast and then come back. Uh, we would do three weeks. You'd fly out and play the Denver Broncos first, then go from the Broncos to the Chargers, Chargers to Oakland, or Chargers, or oh, Oakland to the uh, Chargers. Go. And we were out in California. This is my rookie year with Jack. And uh, after the uh, Saturday practice, he comes in the room. He says, Eddie, uh, he said, I got tickets for this big uh, rivalry game. And I'm thinking, you know, Southern Cal, Cal, or Southern Cal, UCLA. He says, you want to go? I said, who is it? He said, Oxy uh, Claremont Mutt. I said, who? <laughs> Oxy Claremont Mutt. I said, that sounds like a dirt fight. I said, uh, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> Well, I recall Saban uh, telling uh, Kemp on one occasion in the in, in the dressing room, getting ready for practice, Kemp would be, as the guys alluded to, he'd be talking politics, political aspirations, and so and so. So one day, uh, Saban said, "Jack, get your mind off that politics and start reading or thinking about those plays. We got a game Saturday or Sunday." <laughs> I recall that very vividly. Well, you know, the the thing about it is too that you got to realize what Jack meant to the, to the Buffalo Bills. Because we only had four coaches in those days. And the head coach was one of them. Lou Saban coached the defensive line, basically. Uh, Joe Collier had the defense, the, all, the secondary linebackers. 
Uh, Johnny Mazur was the offense, uh, everything in the offense, and then Jerry Smith was the offensive line coach. So that's all we really had. And I think that, honest to God, Lou Saban really depended on Jack for what part of the game plan, the things that were going on. Because Jack was, I mean, he was that smart. Jack knew everything he was going to do when he got on the field, and that's what made him so valuable. What was his uh, relationship with Saban like? <laughs> And he didn't like him either. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they, if the, the, the quarterback's calling the plays in those days, right? right. And, and uh, so they must have worked out the game plan together ahead of time. So they were. Well, I, I, you, these guys would know, they're the offensive well, guys, but I think Jack used to just stand there and nod his head at Saban and say, yeah, 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 and well, then go and do what he wanted to do. Jack did what he wanted to do. I learned one thing. If you were on the uh, uh, offensive uh, unit and Jack threw an interception, you did not want to walk off the field next to Jack because Lou Saban would be coming out of the field and he'd say, Jack, you're killing me. What are you doing? You're killing my family. And Jack would say, geez, Lou, I didn't do it on purpose. But, so you would just stay away and let uh, Lou do his thing. I mean, uh, he was unbelievable. Well, one thing I recall in that, uh, regarding that is that uh, Saban was in the plane. Remember Saban was in the plane? He says, okay, run so-and-so, so-and-so, 22 trap on four or something. And uh, Jack would say, the hell with that. We're not running that. We're going to run this play. If it worked, it was great. But if it didn't work, when he came out, we came off the field, that's when Saban would say, you're killing me. What are you doing out there? Uh, Booker, you, you were close to Saban because you played, played for him in college. So what, 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 what's your view of the kept saving relationship. Well, like I said, uh, you know, being on defense, I didn't, back in those days, the offense and defense really didn't mingle together. They, you know, they kept them separate and everything because we was a lot smarter than the offense. <laughs> we, we, we knew what much, our assignment much, was. Much smarter. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, but one of the things, one thing about Lou was, is that, I mean, Lou understood uh, the game of football. I mean, he was a great coach. You know, he, he, he was a person that knew talent and he knew how to treat people. You know, he, he, he did it individually. He didn't, he didn't Treat everybody the same, you know. Um, but he he would see a play develop, and he'll say, no, he'll stop it. He said, you know, no, that's not the play. Now, he didn't know what the play it was, but he knew it wasn't ran properly. So he told him to do it again. And that was one of the things I used to see all the time, not only here in Buffalo, but when I was at Western Illinois University, is that he knew what play should be called and how it should be run. He didn't necessarily know what the play it, itself was. And, uh, and I used to hear him stop the play a lot of times with Jack and Cookie and Ray Carlton. They was running the plays wrong. And I know they always took time out to, to you know, analyze what they was doing. Uh, but like I said, the biggest thing was is that the defense and offense was totally separate. And so we never really got into what was going on. But I'd just like to say is that uh, Everybody else alluded to Jack being in his politics. Is that uh, I used to listen to him and Cookie and Art Powell and anybody else would listen to Jack because he really believed in a lot of social issues and he was very concerned ab about society and where they was going. But he also tried to uh, advise the ball players about the social issues that they need to be taking a look at. So I always admire him for that, you know, that he, he, he was always on the lookout for his teammates, you know, even in business uh, situations. When, when business opportunities came up, he let us know, you know, so we could take advantage of it. However, we wasn't making any money back in those days, so we couldn't take advantage of anything. You know, we were barely able to buy groceries. Yeah. Well, he used to loan me a lot of money. I know that. <laughs> That's good. Eddie, Eddie, tell, tell about the... the, the, the uh, part that Jack played with uh, Houston, uh, uh, New Orleans All-Star game? Well, uh, oh, we're good. yeah, we'll get to that. Th okay. This is the, the all yeah, we will, we will get, get okay. to the All-Star game in but, detail. But yeah, this is uh, alluding to what uh, Booker said about uh, social issues. Uh, you know, Jack and I would be uh, driving to and from uh, uh, practice together, and uh, we're coming back home, and we had our, our tin our, the itinerary for the uh, uh, upcoming trip, and it was an away game, and Jack uh, was looking at the thing, and he said, he said Eddie, he said, uh, Got all the white guys rooming together and all the black guys rooming. Together. Why don't we intermingle uh, the uh, rooming arrangement? And I said, I don't know, Jack. I said, you're the captain. Find out. So he uh, called uh, Jack Horgan, 
And he asked him, he said, why do you have all the blacks rooming together? Jack and all the white is who? He was the vice president of uh, uh, public relations mm -hmm. for the Buffalo Bills. And Jack said, I don't know. We thought that was what you guys want. Jack said, no, no, no. We want to uh, start rooming uh, together. So Jack roomed with uh, Art Powell in uh, Kansas City trip. I roomed with uh, Booker, and he taught me about black eyed peas, and I taught him <laughs> about Polish kielbasa. And, and uh, we really uh, uh, had a significant part to play in the civil rights movement, uh, not knowing that we actually did play a pretty good part. Well, let's, let's go to the, to the uh, 65 All-Star game then. Uh, you, Eddie, you ended up being the spokesman for the, for the black players down in, in New Orleans about leaving. D why don't you just describe the whole scene about what, what went on in New Orleans? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, uh, we went to New Orleans to play this All-Star game. I think that was 65, I believe it was. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we were told that everything was fine. We'd be, we would not be subjected to any uh, segregation or anything like that. So, okay, we go to New Orleans. So, uh, <clears throat> the night before the game, uh, Jack said, uh, hey, Ernie, why don't we, uh, we got, let's go and hit a couple of spots on uh, the Bourbon Street. Let's go down, let's go down. I said, you guys go ahead because just realizing in my own mind where I was and what the history was. Well, maybe I shouldn't go, but Jack insisted that I go. So we go down on Bourbon Street, and we all go to walk into the place, and there was this attendant outside the place that would say, everybody, come on in. And when, when the black guys started, they said, look, not you guys. No, we don't serve your kind. No, we don't serve you. And Jack would be inside, and he'd look around and say, Ernie, come on. I said, they won't let me in. So uh, I didn't fight it or anything, or make a scene. So after a couple of times, I said, uh, Jack, why don't you guys go ahead? I think Duvinian was along with us, and I forget who else. I said, why don't you go? I'm going back. We're going back to the hotel. And uh, I said, no, we're going to find a place. We're going to find a place. Well, we didn't find We didn't find any place. So the next morning... But Jack would leave, leave with you guys? Uh, you know, I don't recall whether he left with us or not. I don't know. I can't say at this point whether he, we all came back together. I don't think we did. I think it was just a couple of black guys that got a cab. Did you have to stay at separate hotels? No, we were in the oh, same okay. hotel. Yeah. Right. But we, we, uh, we got a cab and came back to the hotel. But on the, on the matter of the cabs, uh, i got to add Cook and Gilchrist to this. We were outside and we said, taxi! And the, and the, the driver said, uh, we don't serve y'all. Uh, you got to call a black cab. And Cookie said, we don't care what color the cab is. <laughs> we just want a cab. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, well, we came back to the hotel. Then the next morning, Cookie Gilchrist called a meeting of all the black players, so the West Squad and the East Squad, and we started comparing notes on who, on what we had encountered, all the black guys that had encountered uh, segregation that, the night before on both sides, the uh, East Squad and the West Squad. So it was determined at that point that are we going to play the game, or are we not going to play the game? And, of course, Cookie was the one that spearheaded it. I'm not going to play. If that's the way it's going to be. I'm not going to play it. And Abner Haynes, who, for you, those that don't know, who was black, said, uh, well, what are we going to do? And we said, oh, well, we're not going to play. We're going home. We're going to leave. So Abner Haynes said, now, look, don't let me get back in Houston and turn on the TV, and all you black guys are playing. <laughs> so I'll be mad. So uh, <clears throat> we decided that we wouldn't play in this meeting. We made that decision, and all the guys got up and started walking out. And they said, uh, oh, we need, uh, we need somebody. By that time, the press was outside the door. I don't know how they found out about this, but they were outside the door. And we said, Cookie, since you spearheaded this whole thing, uh, why don't you uh, talk to the press? And of course he said, no, I'm not talking to the press because I think I'm the one that s s 
started all this, so I'm not talking. So we need somebody else. So let's get one of the older guys to talk. Ernie, you be the spokesman. <laughs> and everybody walked out <laughs> and left me there. So I had to hurriedly try to put something get together to make it sound a little professional anyway. So I explained why we had decided, made it, all the black guys had made a decision not to play because of the discrimination that we had encountered the night before. But Cookie was really the one that, Cookie Gilchrist was really the one that uh, spearheaded the whole thing. Now, who else was there at the time? Were you there? No. No? Anybody else was? No, I was. I'll tell you, in 1961, we were going to, uh, to Dallas to play with the Chargers. And Jack was our quarterback then. And Hilton, Baron Hilton owned the team. So when we went to Dallas, uh, we only had, I think, maybe eight or nine black guys on the team. And we weren't allowed in the Hilton in Dallas. And the owner of the team owned the hotel. <laughs> so they said, okay, the white guys can stay at the Hilton, but the black guys, you have to go to Grand Prairie, Texas, which is right outside. And Jack Kemp went to Sid Gilman and said, this is not acceptable. Either we stay as a team or we don't play. And Jack Kemp was the guy that actually did it. We all ended up in the crappiest hotel in Grand Prairie, <laughs> Texas, because of Kemp. <laughs> and I want it in the ledger. <laughs> no, that, but that was, I mean, it was absolutely the right thing to do. It, we, we had no problem. When uh, in, in the New Orleans case, I mean, he was the president of the AFL Players Association. Did he have a role in ha getting the game moved to Houston? I, I don't know whether he had a role in that or not, but... Uh... I did not say that he was the one that said uh, it, came, it told the black players, the group, that, look, I'm with you guys 100%. If, if that's your decision not to play, I'm with you 100%. Larry, were you down there and did you I was down this? there, yes. Yeah, tell, tell us what you saw. Uh, just about what Ernie talked about. Uh, would, you, would, you get, would you get the, the uh, start talking to these guys and players from the other, black players from the other team, uh, the North Squad, uh, what was it like when you went to try to go to dinner or you tried to go to any nightclub or anything like that? Same story. It was a shot out all the way, and they had been promised ahead of time. Uh, it was a prom. The, the guy who sponsored the game was a well to, to do, well known uh, jeweler uh, in, in New Orleans. And he met well. He was not a racist at all. But he assumed so, much, so many things, like, like, like the, 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 the color line was going to topple because of him. And there was no such agreement whatsoever. And it was, uh, it was a total mess. And it would have been an even blacker, part the expression, I, if they hadn't, if they had gone to Houston, and the black players hadn't agreed to go, I mean, these guys and the the other black players and the other teams saved an enormous amount of face for the league. Mm -hmm. Did you, did uh, did did Jack have any role in the in the switch? Do you remember? I don't remember that. No, no. I'd like to say he did, but I, I, one way or the other, I can't remember. What what I mean? This is the the midst of the civil rights move, movement time. Um, uh, what 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 was the what was race relations like in the NF in the AFL, and how was Buffalo different from other teams? Well, one thing I don't know how Buffalo is different from any other team, but uh, we had a lot of guys that, that played from uh, came from Southern colleges and everything. But they was the early ones that came in, and uh, so they sort of like got indoctrinated to what was going on. Uh, I know when I got here in 62, um, there were still a few guys on the team that really didn't want to have anything to do with uh, black ball players, you know. Um, and um, so uh, it made it very difficult to have some kind of conversation with them. Um, fortunately, there was, off, there was offensive linemen. You know, didn't have no problem, so I didn't have to do with them anyway. But, but the, <laughs> you, know, you really never did like the offense. I didn't like the offense at all. You know, but but the thing was is that 
uh, that that whole uh, racial situation, it just would not go away you know, when we played exhibition game in in, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and, and back to what Paul said, you know, Hilton, he owned the hotels, and, and we was at a Hilton Hotel. And when we got there, I had, Saban brought me into the meeting. He said, Booker, I want you to have a meeting with all the black ball players because they didn't want to go. Cookie, Tom Day, uh, Jim Sorry, uh, Willie West, all the guys said, no, we don't want to go down south. We don't want to, no parts of it. So we had experience when I was in college, and Saban said, well, look, why don't you go and talk to him? And I said, well, why me? I said, I'm just a rookie. <laughs> they don't listen to me. Well, you know, talk to him. So I went in and I talked to the guys and said, so look, let me put it this way. If, if we don't get treated properly, we don't have to play. That's just the way it is. We don't have to play. So, so they all agreed to go. And so we got down there, and when we got there, just as sure as the, the day was day and night was night, they told us we could not stay there. And so now we got to go to the, the hotel across town and, 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 and the white players stay in, in, in the Hilton. Um, so Saban said, look, you guys do not have to play if you don't want to play. But what, you, what I need from you is, is unity. If, if all do not want to play, you don't have to play. If one decides to play, you play, or vice versa. And uh, there was a couple guys um, that said that they would play because their livelihood depended on it and they was trying to make the team and everything and so they said well we're going to play so we ended up playing but we went to the, uh, the restaurant that morning to eat breakfast. this is what town now this is in Tulsa mm -hmm. you know we went to the College. restaurant huh? this is this is the Bills yeah we played exhibition game yeah. New York oh, Jets okay um, and and we went to this, this restaurant uh, to get something to eat that morning and I tell you uh, People was ordering food and everything, and, and I'm getting ready to order, and I'm looking, and I'm looking at the cooks, and, and the sweat was falling off their heads <laughs> into the food, and I said, hmm, I don't think so, you know, and, and, and uh, so, so when... Give me a bowl of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when, the, when the waitress asked me what I wanted, I just told her, I said, give, give me a bowl of ice cream and, and a pie, <laughs> you know, a piece of pie, you know, and I know no sweat's going to fall off the neck, you know. <laughs> And, and that's what I had uh, for, for breakfast that morning. And, uh, but um, from that point on, everything else was good. Uh, the ball players here in Buffalo, they, they finally got on the same page with everybody else. And we really didn't have any problems here in Buffalo in terms of the racial situation and everything. So, uh, I mean, obviously there was a few guys, as I said, that we had some problems with, but they finally, you know, uh, came over and, and did all right. Charlie? But all, all the team yeah. parties, I mean, you know, when we'd go after a game on Monday, uh, you know, we never segregated ourselves. We didn't go all as a bunch of white guys and a bunch of black guys. And then we always had the uh, the great uh, Halloween party. At yeah, Ron McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. we've got some pictures that we can't show today to this day. <laughs> but uh, some of the costumes were kind of unique. Uh, Jack Kemp had a, had a shirt on that said, uh, 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 burn baby burn Stokely Carmichael for president and stuff. I mean, uh, we had some good times, but no, we uh, uh, and we made some friendships uh, during those times that today, you know, uh, last a lifetime. You know, Booker, Charlie, and Ernie. And you know, the surrounding things that, that that were there more, we could control in our locker room, and the word always was, "What that happens in our locker room stays in our locker room." It was about us. It wasn't about the people in Buffalo or the people in San Diego. It was about the Buffalo Bills, and you know, with Jack. And this is about Jack. Jack was a hell of a leader for us. He really was. I mean, he took charge. And you know, I, I, I remember that we had a strike in what, what uh, 67, 60, whatever it was. We were on a strike and we were working out. And Jack was ahead of the Players Association, I guess, at that time. He said, you know, we're going to strike. And then all the wives said, well, if you strike, you ain't getting any. <laughs> so the strike only lasted a day. <laughs> it was, it was, it's true. Come on. She actually said the only thing. We had the wives broke the strike. <laughs> Players didn't. 
happens in two Okay, days. Charlie, you, you haven't weighed in on this on this on the subject of the, of the racial racial I will We'll get back to the strike. Well I, I would just like to say that uh, you know, between Jack Paul was very instrumental in making a lot of things happen. The team stayed together. I mean, his humor <laughs> was really uh, so important uh, to the guys. And I think that uh, he may not realize that, but Paul, you really uh, made a lot of things happen. The Thank team you. together, along with Jack, with his leadership. And uh, I think that's what really had us to work uh, extremely close together as a team. You know, we just worked together. We did a lot of things together, and you know, it was not a, not a problem. And I know it, Paul it, and Jack; uh, they heard uh, Tom Day call me Noopy, so they fell in line, and they had no idea what Noopy meant. They never asked. I don't know if Paul. <laughs> sure, sure no, I, didn't, I don't know what perspicacity is. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a fraternity code. Tom and I were frat brothers. Uh -huh. So they started calling me Noop because that was the way Tom addressed me as Fly Noopy. <laughs> so Paul and uh, Jack used to always do that themselves. Then it picked up. I think yeah, Ed I, used to I call started, me that. I still, still do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Hey, Noop. Yeah. So um, uh, I think we're done with the with the civil rights uh, with the civil rights issue. Let, let me ask you, uh, Ed, how did uh, Jack handle booing and you know because he got a fair amount of it. So. He said, uh, you know, when they asked him, uh, and they threw, and they threw stuff, right? Is that yeah, true? He, his his favorite uh, joke was, he said, uh, you know, after he got through with football, when he was going to run for Congress, he said, uh, you know, these guys today, they get criticized. They're too sensitive. You know, uh, people criticize them and everything. He said, when we played, he said, if I threw an interception or we had a bad play, he said that people would throw garbage at us and beer cans <laughs> and rotten tomatoes. And that's when we were coming out of our house. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he, his famous line was, uh, if you could take uh, uh, the booze of uh, 47,000 people in War Memorial Stadium, you could take the political heat and the politics. And, Isn't and it true that the one thing at War Memorial Stadium, which, which, which we all had to, they, they just said, when you come down the steps and you're heading onto the field because we had to go out of the tunnel, always keep your helmet on. Right. <laughs> all, I'm, I'm not talking about after a game, whether you want or not. Always keep your helmet on. I was with the Chargers. We came in here in 1960, and we used to play these guys on Friday night. And Sid Gilman said, when we leave this game, because we beat them, he said, when we leave this game, keep your helmets on. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Went right behind us on our bench are guard dogs in Buffalo. And I went, oh, my God. So I put my helmet on. And a guy throws a full can of beer at me. I say, hey, thanks, man. And I, you know, <laughs> and I had to wait to get to the locker room. But they were very friendly. I mean, they didn't just throw up stuff at those guys. They threw stuff at the Chargers, too, when we were there. They, were, they did not segregate anybody. Now, what, what, uh, what happened when, when uh, you know, he threw an interception or, some, or, or a receiver missed, missed a, a catch? What, did he get mad? Did he? Well, as, as, in those days... As the uh, offensive line, as Booker would say, we never had much, too much to say. You know what I mean? We just well, what did you hear? Very well. We just heard a lot of bitching, which they already said. You know, <laughs> why didn't you catch it? Or what's wrong with you? Or this and that. And but we weren't. Uh, did you we, hear it from Jack? Did Jack, Jack criticize was, Jack, any? Jack was a fairly uh, quiet person, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he was a very smart individual. And he just. He, uh, he knew that he wouldn't let uh, a scoot up pass bother him, and uh, that's what kept him. He just kept going. He just he wouldn't quit. And Jack was a tough. You know, I, I, the thing I remember about Jack the most is his toughness. He was a very strong, tough. Uh, and, uh, although he wasn't a very big person, he was he was very tough. And uh, no, we didn't get into the offensive line. We didn't say too much. How about we your were, receivers? What, what, what happened if he... They're the talkers. If, if you, <laughs> yeah, when uh, we were playing the uh, Miami Dolphins, and I was uh, playing split end at that time, when we got down to the uh, 50 We lost that one, too. <laughs> 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 and it was in December, and it was cold. Uh, you know, your feet are cold. We didn't have the hand warmers and all this stuff that these guys have today, and my hands were like, like ice. Jack and had then, a hand warmer. No, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> We moved down by <laughs> Anyway, uh, he called a quick post pattern where you go down about uh, seven yards and slant to the inside. And, and I was wide open. I had two steps on the cornerback, and he threw a pass, and it hit me right in the hands. And my hands were so cold. 
it bounced out of my hand. I, I came back to the huddle. He chewed me out. <laughs> he said, you know, you got a whole lot of those things. You know, there aren't that many times when you're going to get open like that. And I said, Jack, I, I said, I, I can't feel a thing. I said, next time try to, you know, don't lead me. Hit me in the uh, number so I can try to trap it against my shoulder. But that, that was the only time in my career and relationship with Jack that uh, he really ever nasty had nasty words about me. And he never threw a pass to you again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I remember uh, in the huddle sometimes when uh, Jack would ask uh, uh, Dubinion, what you got, Doobie? Meaning, what is open? What can you, what can you get open on? And Doobie, <laughs> I, I don't have a damn thing. <laughs> 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 uh, they beat me up as soon as I line up. Uh, and he says, Bass, where you got Bass? And Bass would say, uh, uh, Jack, oh, I don't have anything. <laughs> they won't let me off the line. I used to crack up with that. And then I would say, well, uh, I made a joke of that. And I said, uh, I said well, Jack, just throw really an incomplete pass like you always do. <laughs> that was a joke, though. So, Charlie? Well, I can go back and uh, remember an incident where Jack and I uh, used to communicate a lot. And uh, one day Jack said, Fergie, let's keep this to ourselves and um, let's work on the alley-oop pair. R.C. Owens with the 49ers uh, developed that pair. They used to call it the alley-oop. So we were around about the 10-yard line. I can't recall who we were playing at that time. And Jack looked at me and he called the play. It was like a curl, and I was supposed to go and turn in, and he was going to throw it high. But somehow, the ball didn't come high to me, and the ball was intercepted in the end zone. I never said any more to Jack about it. <laughs> Jack never said any more to me about it. <laughs> so that was the end of our alley-oop at that time. Okay, so now I have to ask about the, the quarterback controversy. Um, Saban would play Jack, and then he'd pull Jack if, if Jack wasn't performing, and then put Daryl LaMonica in. So uh, what, what was Saban's uh, philosophy about who, who he played as, as quarterback? Larry, what, what do you know about that? I think it was his mood at the time, I think <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, if he had enough of uh, Jack, uh, he just he, he had enough confidence in LaMonica, after his, at least starting with his second year, that he, that he put uh, Darrell in there. Darrell was a very confident guy. And uh, Eddie tells the story all about telling him about the... Uh, yeah, well, he was playing in his game, and he uh, missed his first 11 passes, was all incomplete or intercepted or anything. And like Eddie always say, when, when, when you'd come out, Saban would say, you're killing me. What are you doing? Think. <laughs> And LaMonica's standing there listening to all this uh, diatribe, and then he says, Coach, don't worry about it. I'm going to complete my next 11 passes. <laughs> and Samus says, how the hell do you know that? I'm a 50% passer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, 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 that was La, La, La Monica. But uh, uh, even though there was a, a great uh, 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 rivalry there, it never spilled over where one guy was mad at the other one. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they had it civil, civilly. So in what sense was there a rivalry? Yes, there was a rivalry, yes. Uh, I used to stand on the sidelines next to, to, to La Monica, and La Monica would uh, call what play he would call. And he'd tell me, I'm, I would call this Eddie, and I would call that Eddie. And then, you know, uh, uh, if it worked, okay. If it didn't, if Jack did okay, then he didn't get in. But... Uh, he was always in there, and same thing with Jack. Jack always was in the game. Uh, if he wasn't playing, he was at least, like Eddie said, taking taking part in the, what what plays the call. And but that's how Lou got the best out of all of us. Right. I mean, he knew how to get that out. He knew that Jack was a fierce competitor, and that if you pulled Jack out of the game, Jack was going to want to fight exactly. like heck to get back into the game and make up for whatever he did. And and that's how Lou treated it. I recall. We were playing the game against the uh, 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 New York Jets, and Doobie was injured. The other wide receiver was injured. I was going to start that game along with Glenn Bass. And uh, we were uh, at the end of a practice, and uh, when practice was over, uh, we're all going in, and Luke came walking over, and he said, uh, he said, young man, uh, 
you know how we're going to win this game, don't we? Yeah, you got to score more points. He said, no. He said, it's all on your shoulders. He said, you're going to have a hell of a game. If you don't, we're going to lose. Well, talk about putting pressure on <laughs> And then uh, I said, no, no, no. <laughs> we, we won. I, oh. And I had a, a, a heck of a game. But um, tw at the 25th uh, reunion, when we had everybody back, uh, I told Glenn Bass that story. He said, you know, Saban said the same thing to me. <laughs> he said, he called me over and he said, Glenn, if you don't have a hell of a game, we're going to lose and we're counting on you to make this happen. But what I read, I read somewhere that, s that uh, the Bills went like 0-3 one year and Saban refused to talk to anybody on the team for weeks. Is that true? No. Anybody? No. No, no? I don't oh, met, well, met before I got here. No, no, we wouldn't allow it. We didn't talk to him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you have to understand something. Yeah. You know, the rivalry and everything was made up. Sorry, Larry, by the press that's, that's and, right. and by by the fans. Had nothing to do with these two guys. Jack would not allow it. You know, Daryl wanted to play, which was, I mean, hell yeah, I wanted to play. If if, if you didn't want to sit on the bench, you want to play. You got to remember, there were only 32 guys on the team at that time. You didn't do your job. The guy behind you is going to go in and play. Mm -hmm. And when he screws up, they're going to put you back in the game. This is the way the game was. There were games when when Jack didn't play well. Daryl came in, he wouldn't play well. Jack went back yeah, in the game. Back in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. The fans made it something that it really wasn't. If, if you sat and listened to these guys before a game, man, they talked to each other about the game, the strategy, right. and what the hell was going on. If something happens and you're in exactly. there, this would happen. Exactly. And when Daryl got in, Jack was right there to help him. When he, I mean, this stuff was done by media and fans, not by the players. This football team would not allow it. I think this is something that I talked to you before about, is that uh, one thing about Lou, hey, if you produce, you stay. If you don't, you go. And, and he had no qualms about yanking Jack and putting Daryl in. And if Daryl was not on, on par, he snatched Daryl right back out of there and put Jack back in. And, 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 that is, and, and as Paul was saying, and, and I said before, is that it was media driven, it was fan driven, just like today, you know, everything comes up, but you, you never hear about a running back controversy or wide receiver controversy. It's always a quarterback controversy. You know, I, I mean, even right now, they, they got quarterbacks being drafted oh, right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so oh, it's, it's always that, you know. But, but that's what media is about. That's what uh, the fans are about. They have opinions, and they, they, they understand the game of football. But as people ask me, they, they talk about the game. Why don't the coach put so-and-so in? Or why don't the coach do this? And why don't the coach run that play? And I'm saying, look, the coaches and the players know more about what they're doing out there than the fans and anybody else, because they the one put the game plan together. So whatever they put together, they know what they're doing. And but it's strictly media and fan driven, which is fine because they paid eight dollars to to have that opinion. But Lou Saban never had a problem with that. And Jack, even though Jack was competitive and everything, he understood what the game was all about, and that's winning. <laughs> did did the uh, did the fans and the media? Have a favorite in the, in the. Well, it depends. You know, we're in an ethnic <laughs> town, so they checked the gate, and if there were a lot of Italians at the game, the girl was definitely going to get in. If they, if they weren't, you know, hey, Jack could play the entire game. <laughs> when, when Jack was uh, running for uh, uh, vice president with uh, Dole, um, he called me and uh, he said. Uh, I'm going to be in Erie, Pennsylvania. He said, why don't you and Mary Lou meet me at, uh, in, in Pennsylvania because I'm going to be speaking at the courthouse with uh, Governor Ridge. So Mary Lou and I drove down there and uh, met Tom Ridge at the airport and Jack uh, came up and we drove in the motorcade and went down to uh, the courthouse and uh, 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 they introduced us all and uh, said some nice things about me and then Jack got up and he started speaking. You know, Jack's up there speaking and talking and they had a bunch of demonstrators, about 15 demonstrators, and they put them across the street and they had cordoned the area off with uh, this, this yellow tape because they didn't want them disturbing anything. And Jack's talking, you know, and he keeps looking over to his left and uh, finally, uh, and he says this good naturedly, he said, uh, Hey, you over there. And everybody looks over there. He said, you know, you can make fun of my economics and you can make fun of my politics, but don't ever make fun of my football. And there was a guy with a big sign that said, put in La Monica. Put in La Monica. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. Uh, so uh, we drive back to the airport and Jack and Joanne get on the airplane and, and, and Mary Lou and I get in the car and we're driving back and we're driving back and he gets me on the cell phone. He said, uh, Eddie, 
He said, uh, you know, the, the press was there, and he said, uh, they're going to take that out of context. He said, I know they're going to call Daryl, and he's going to say something uh, stupid, and it's going to embarrass me. And, and I said, Jack, I said, don't worry about it. I said, you know, I'll, I'll track Daryl down. So it took me two days to find Daryl, and I told him the situation. He, he just started laughing. He said, don't worry. He said, I, I support Jack and the, and the president. He said, I won't say anything embarrassing. But uh, You're talking you about know. my hometown, Eddie. There you go. <laughs> Erie, Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up, yep. Um, there was a game in, I think it was the end of the 64 season, uh, in that snow game uh, that, you, that you won, I think, 24 to 14. And the question was, who was going to start? And Jack, according to Rock on the Rock Pile, the book, goes to Saban and he says, look, you've got to decide who your quarterback is. So it did get to Jack a little bit, didn't it? Well, uh, any, anybody who's a competitor, <laughs> you know, given the choice between me and my competitor, you know, you want me in the game. And uh, Jack was a very confident individual, and he thought he could pull us through, and he did. Yeah. Martin, one of the things you got to take into consideration when, when, when you read that, and, and don't and take it in context, but when you read that, and, and you've got to realize something, that the starting quarterback, there's only so much time you spend on the practice field. Wednesday is offensive day, Thursday is defensive day, and they combine the, the two of them on Friday. The, the starting quarterback gets to most of the work. So it, it, you, the quarterback needs to know who the hell's starting. Is it going to be me or is it going to be him? I mean, it, it was a legitimate question to ask. Now everybody said, well, there's the controversy. There was, there was none. Just wanted to know, am I going to be your starter or am I not? It's that simple. The media needs to defend itself. Larry? Uh, they're, they're just about right about all this stuff. I mean, uh, as far as playing favorites or anything like that, that didn't exist. Uh, I mean, I, I wanted to see the quarterback in there who was at, with the hottest hand, who, who was playing best at the time. I think most of the, most of sports writers are like that. Um, I, I, both of these, both of these guys were good quarterbacks, and. And we had situations here in the last few years where you've got the, 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 the fans are split between one quarterback or another when, in fact, neither one of them could play in the situation. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the Cap and the Monica rivalry, both of them could play. And uh, with the, in, it's inevitable that there be uh, a... Uh, you know, split that with the fans, and as far as the media goes, we're just looking for a good story. Yeah. You know, and it truly is true, Moore. You, you, you could boo Jack, and he walks on the field and throws a touchdown pass, and 41,000 people go nuts, and they yeah, love him, yeah, yeah. you know. And if he throws an interception, and they're going to boom, come off the field. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, it, and it always will be that way. If you get into, into uh, politics or sports, with a thin skin, you're never going to survive. Not right. in this business. I'm going to tell you. Well, yeah, it's in the media business, the journalism business. Same thing. You better have some tough skin. Yep. So, Al, Al, I have to ask you this. Um, no, uh, no what was it like, what was the difference in having Jack and Daryl under you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it really didn't make much difference to me. You know, they, were, they both, uh, at that particular time, as I said before, there was... A, they always was up underneath you. You didn't have to snap the ball back or anything, worry about anything like that. But uh, they were both great people, and everything that these people are saying here now, uh, they all got along. We got along with everybody, and and uh, it didn't, no. I, I was just, especially my situation, I was just very, very happy, very, very lucky boy to be where I was. But could so you they trust Daryl? They, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they could have put... Uh, him behind me. Oh, very happy. You want to ask? I heard about his hands. You want to ask Eddie how 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 he was torn between two guys, a Notre yeah. Dame guy and a, a, his best friend Jack Kemp. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just wanted to add a little something about the. It it could really get crazy with the fans when uh, uh, Paul was talking about somebody throwing a can. That was still half full uh, in Moore Memorial Stadium because they were upset at Jack or something like that. There was one game I can't remember which one it was, but when they when they swept away 
uh, after the game, they, when they cleaned up the field, there were dozens and dozens of, ca of cans that weren't even open. And uh, I mean, that was the same, it was the same game with a way from Mike Stratton, who was a great linebacker for the Bills. Somebody threw a uh, full can of pop right in the back, almost in the head. And that led to at least the same moment. They barred cans and full of full uh, containers in War Memorial, and you had to you had to get a if you wanted a drink, you went to concession stand and got it in a cup. Well, that's where the team used to go right after the games of the field. <laughs> <laughs> but di didn't we used to have to go up through the stands, remember, to get into the uh, locker room at halftime? And, and I'll tell you what, the fans in Buffalo they're great, but if you were having a bad game. <laughs> You would hear some comments going through those stands, boy. I'll tell you. Hurry up. <laughs> Walk faster if you're so, having so, a bad game. So, uh, but answer what Ed was asking about. So were you torn? You had this. You had a uh, Notre Dame uh, teammate and your best friend sort of rivalry. How did oh, you know, we knew Darrell was a good quarterback. But Jack, you know, he had the arm, the leadership capability, and he led us and he won for us. And, uh, you know, he was the man. We knew that. And, and when Darrell got traded... That was the best thing that ever happened to Daryl. I mean, he went out and he had a cast of characters that were unbelievable. I used to follow his stats because Daryl and I were competitors at Notre Dame. We both uh, went there as quarterbacks. And I'd see where, uh, you know, Daryl threw uh, Hewitt Dixon, their fullback, you know, a 64-yard touchdown pass. And I'm thinking, to Hewitt Dixon? Yeah. And Daryl drops back and I'd see the film. He'd dump this little four-yard pass to Hewitt Dixon and he would run over about five or six people 46 <laughs> yards down the field. And, you know, uh, that's the kind of talent he had around him. So it was a great move for Daryl. Mort, the one thing that, it, that all of these guys understand, and it is today, and with all athletes especially, uh, and on a team, if you didn't want to play, if you were just happy to be there, you know, it tore a guy apart that he couldn't play. And it did Daryl and it did Jack. When it, you want to play. I mean, I just, I just remember this guy, just real short. I remember when, when, when uh, somebody got hurt and Al had to move to guard. And he, I'm going to tell you something, he was the best center in, 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 in their league. He had to move to guard. Not one word was said. He just moved. It was for the betterment of the team. And these guys understood it. The only thing, and Larry said, the only thing that's important is winning, for God's sake. I mean, all this other crap that goes on, that, that's what people perceive and they think that, well, and we know what's going on in the locker room. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Like some jackass. I walked out of the stadium one time in Buffalo. We got beat 41 nothing. And a guy pulls me up, and he's half smashed. And he goes, hey, what happened? I said, hey, you had a better seat than I did, man. Tell me what happened. <laughs> what happened? So, so uh, but isn't an exception to that rule, the whole Cookie Gil 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 Gilchrist controversy, where Cookie uh, refused to play at a point because um, Jack was passing and he wanted the ball how did that go down how did it all happen i don't i don't i'm but again i'm with booker i don't we don't care about the offense <laughs> <laughs> i can give you my take on it uh, uh what had happened is cookie had a, 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 a something in his contract he if he got so many yards he got a bonus and in the game uh we the the defense they were showing us we we, we were passing more and he walked off the field at halftime and just refused to play. And so Lou put in the other guy, and Lou fired Gilchrist. But Jack, we were wanted to win the championship, and Jack and the other guys, I don't know who, these guys probably know better than I do, Jack and, 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 and the other guys went to Saban, and Saban said, told them, hey, you always told us we're a family. We need Cookie. To, to, to win, win this uh, uh, championship. So Lou said, okay, I'll take him back, but he's gone at the end of the year. And that's exactly what happened. But Jack was very instrumental in having Cookie come back. Yeah. One convince. of the things with that was that uh, um, and Cookie and I, we, we were roommates, plus we were you know, great friends and forever. You know, he was my mentor and anything else along the way. Um, as Eddie was saying, is that it's part of the contract, and I think I mentioned this before. You know, all all players have uh, incentives in their contract, and and I'm quite sure Jack had something about how many passes that he completed and how many yardage and stuff like that. And Cookie had uh, the thing about carrying the ball, 
you know, 30 times a game, 30, 35 times a game. Uh, he was the first uh, American Football League player that, that they gained 1,000 yards. Uh, they scored five touchdowns in one game. Um, so there was incentives in his contract that if he got X, Y, Z, then he would get paid. Same thing. He said, play me on defense as a linebacker, but you better give me another contract. <laughs> you know? And so when, when this whole thing came down, you know, Cookie didn't want to leave Buffalo. He didn't want, you know, he, he never was a quitter. He never was anything. But there was a, it was an instinctive thing to just he did what he did, and 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 you know the old story said once you did it and you thought about it, you were sorry. It's too late. It's already done. And so when Jack called him and they talked, and Cookie, uh, you know, stated that he would apologize and everything, then it became to a public apology. Uh, that wasn't what it's supposed to have been. It was just supposed to be an apology. That's all. Uh, and so I think that that was uh, that got into Cookie's crawl is that that he had to make a public apology to the to the team and everything about what happened because there was more to it than what people had said it was. Um, but all in all, Cookie have always said in the past is that hey, it was the right thing to do. He had no animosity towards Jack. In fact, him and Jack were very good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, they talked along the, along the way from, from after football and everything. And, and, and Jack was very instrumental in a lot of things that, that Cookie did after his football career. So, no, Cookie and Jack was like this. And, and, uh, uh, and Cookie never, never denied the fact that, uh, that I did the wrong thing when I, when I walked off the field. Not only did I disappoint myself, I did disappointed my teammates. Anybody else have a take on this? Watching it? No. Okay. Uh, what was Jack's rela relationship since he was the the uh, president of the Players Association with Mr. Wilson? Ed. He had uh, a high degree of respect for uh, Ralph Wilson. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I recall when. Uh, Ralph's dad passed away, and uh, we went to uh, the wake. Uh, Jack and I drove to, together, and uh, when we went up to the uh, casket, uh, he saw Ralph Wilson's dad in the casket with his hands crossed with the Buffalo Bills championship ring on his finger, and he just, he just couldn't believe it. Uh, although Jack was president of the Players Association, uh, uh, it, it, we, we didn't do anything that was that controversial or that demanding at that time. Uh, he was just trying to get b better benefits and better money for the ball players, and it wasn't as contentious as it was uh, uh, years ago or, or even uh, today when they're trying to uh, redo the uh, CBA. It was more making sure that uh, we tried to provide some new, uh, 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 like a, he had a, 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 a thing, he proposed a CAP, C-A-P, a career adjustment pay, so that when you retire from professional football, you would get a certain amount of money to make a transition from football into the uh, private sector so that it wasn't an abrupt change. Uh, and he was very sensitive to that. But no, it wasn't contentious, uh, and he did a great job for us. But you did strike once? Yeah, we did. It was 67? 60, it wasn't for a while. It only lasted yeah. a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what the issue was? <laughs> huh? Do you remember what the issue was? Money. Isn't it always? I mean, in those days, uh, you know. What, what, what did you get paid at the beginning, and what was your highest pay as a, as a bill? Well, I started in 1960. Well, I know Ernie didn't make anything in Canada. So I paid, in 1960, I made $8,000 my first year, and I got a $1,000 bonus, and I signed the contract. And I played 11. My last year was 25000 and that was a lot of money. I don't, I don't ever complain about any of it. And I said to Mr. Wilson once, I said, you know, you owe me some money, pal. You're paying all these guys now? He said, how much did you make? I said, $25,000 my last year. He said, I overpaid you by twenty four five. And that ended that. So, is, is that was, was that about the pay scale for everybody? Al? I got, uh, my first year, I got uh, $1,500 bonus, and uh, $8,500 was my salary. Uh, I went down and played in the blue-gray game, and uh, Detroit had, uh, uh, they, they wanted me to play there. And so the guy, the scout, came up and asked me, uh, did you sign with the Buffalo Bills? And of course, I lied to him. I didn't, I didn't want him to know. I wanted to find out how much they would offer me, you know, how much the NFL at the time would offer me instead of the AFL. 
And I think the, the, the difference was, uh, I think, $1,000 either or either way. So, uh, so, and my highest pay, yours was 25000 mine was 23000 I played 10 years. Think about it. Nine years. Mm -hmm. And, it was, uh, and that was a lot of money. That was a lot yeah, of money then. I had a new, brand new house. I had a brand new car. I, well, Bryce, I had three, four, five help. kids. I, I, was, I was doing good. Yeah. So, Charlie, uh, did you go ahead? No, I was just going to say when I came here to, uh, I started in Cleveland with 7,500 and uh, was traded to Minnesota the next year. And being the uh, leading receiver on the 62 team, I was a hole out in 63. And I was trying to get a $1,500 raise, and I didn't get it. Ben Rockland uh, let me go, and I came here, and Lou uh, asked me, he said, well, what was your contract? I said, well, <laughs> I started studying on him a little. I said, well, this might be my opportunity to get that little 9500 that I was after. But I told him, I said, well, Lou, I was uh, after about a $10,000 contract kind of looked at me. I ended up signing for uh, 8500 when I came here. I went out at 25000 uh, yeah. Now, So what, hap what happened? Um, um, Joe Namath gets $467,000 co uh, contract. Yeah. So did everybody get a bump? I mean, was, did that help no. you? No. 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 Did it Lord, you have to understand, first of all, you got to understand something. With the players, there were some guys that wanted, you know, we got to get more money, we got to do this. All these guys, all they ever wanted to do was play. Yeah. We would have, we would have paid money them. had yeah. nothing to do with it. So help me God, it didn't. Yeah. It, it, had, it was never brought up. Yeah. I, Tom Sestak and I roomed together the whole time I was with the Buffalo Bills. We went into business in 1978. Uh, 68, excuse me. And I had no idea for five years how much money this guy made. He was my roommate. Yeah. Until the day we signed the papers to go into a business together. Then I realized how much money he made. But I, I mean, you, it was you never ask. I, mean, if, I don't. Does anybody here have any idea how much Jack Kent made? He made about forty-five at the end of the uh, year. He was the highest paid on the team because he was a quarterback. But you got to realize uh, we would have we would have paid them to play hmm. if anybody asked. I would not. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe but the they, offensive guys. They would. <laughs> they would send you. Uh, they would send you during the off season your contract with uh, your salary in it. Right. And uh, they expected you to sign it and send it back. And I recall, uh, uh, I forget what year it was, I think it was 67 or 66. And it was during the preseason. And after one of the practices, uh, Harvey Johnson, who was our player personnel guy, uh, after practice, he says, I want to see Rudkowski, uh, Stratton, uh, and McDowell, and, and, uh, and somebody else uh, after practice. And we're thinking, you know, what's this all about? So we go in after practice, and Harvey says, uh, you SOBs, he says, you're holding out, and didn't realize it, but, you know, I had my thing in a drawer in my uh, <laughs> cabinet in the bedroom. I forgot to send it back in, and all of us forgot to send our contracts back in, not that we were holding out. He said, I'm going to give each one of you guys a $1,500 raise, take it or leave it, and he walks out. Well. We all started laughing <laughs> because my contract had a $500 raise and the most anybody had was Stratton. He, he had a $1,000 raise, so now he's going to give all of us $1,500. So we're, we're laughing and we're trying to think who can best go out and represent us with a straight face. So I think it was Mike Stratton. And I came back home. I said, honey, you're not going to play this. But we just got a $1,500 raise. <laughs> Unbelievable. So who was the... Uh, uh, let me uh, ask you, Ed, um, since you're the closest politically to him, I mean, who coined the term the senator about Kim? I don't know who coined the term, but... Uh, I think Tony Marchetti. Was it Marchetti? Marchetti. Yeah. And Tony, who was that? Tony Marchetti was the old-time equipment manager. And because he was always talking and he'd always say... What do you want to be a senator, Kim? <laughs> you know, and then so it just stuck. It and I think it, Eddie Abramowski used to say that we were, used to call Jack the uh, statesman of the bill. So if anybody ever referred to him as that SOB, you knew what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did he did he try to get people to vote for Goldwater and uh, and and Nixon? I'll I'll tell you this. He used to. My my dad was a a, a union representative worked in the steel mill. And Jack used to always run by his theories about everything about politics. I knew he was going. He even gave me the book. He was telling me 
uh, the fall and the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and decadence is going to sit, sit in. <laughs> Eddie, I want you to read this book. And I can remember he would talk to me about Social Security. He would talk to me about that. And I would I, I always kid him. I said, Jack, to get elected, you know that bell-shaped curve? You've got to be in the middle of it. You can't be on one end or the other because you aren't going to be elected. And we used to tease back and forth. Uh, but he'd always use me as a sounding board. Uh, but uh, I, I knew he was going to go, and I, I would have voted for him every time, although his views were entirely different than mine. But he, 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 he like when he was hot, he worried about the, 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 the people. He, he really was concerned about things that, 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 that mattered to the little guy, too, although he, he had his trickle-down theory from Leffler, something I always told him, I don't know how smart you are, but you're well-read. <laughs> you, you know, the other thing, yeah. he, never, he never read books with pictures in them. <laughs> <laughs> he never did. I, you know, he said, do you want to read this? I said, how many pictures? <laughs> <laughs> so did, uh, did every, when, when did everybody realize that he actually was going to run for office? Did he talk about Oh yeah, yeah. I Let's I used to I, when when they when they had the uh, the the AFL days. This is unheard of now. My God, they'd be coaches would be going out of their minds. But the press used to travel with the uh, team to these uh, to the road games, and we were gone for a long time. And even even the flights were usually prop, and uh, you didn't get a lot of jets. So you spend a lot of time together. Well, I, I, Jack used to come down to my seat and looking for a debating partner. And uh, I had a lot with him. He was fun to debate with. Never raised our voices ever. Respected what we had to say. I was an FDR Democrat, still am. But uh, he was always an interesting guy. And the, remember how he used to call himself he referred to himself as a uh, bleeding, uh, bleeding heart conservative. Bleeding heart conservative. Yeah, conservative. conservative. Yeah. He was. That's exactly what he was. And a uh, guy with a huge heart, thought about people, thought about people who didn't have a lot. And uh, and from and I've met a lot of people in sports and a lot of people in business and so on. One of the most uh, admirable people I ever met. You know, I, I'll tell you one thing about Jack Kemp and with all the players. I don't think there's anyone here at this table or on the, on the football team. If wherever he was, we all knew how to get a hold of him, especially with Eddie. And if you said to Eddie or call Jack, he answered. He watched, I don't care how busy he was. He always had time. This was a team. This was a family, one of his first families. Not the media family, but first family. Never had a problem. He was he's just that kind of guy. Did you uh, help help with his campaign when you when he decided no to money, run for Congress? No money. I don't ever give politicians money. <laughs> well, what about what about support. appearances and stuff like that? <laughs> appearances? Yeah. Did you no. go out? And, I mean, you're 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 famous in Buffalo. Did you go help him get elected? No. <laughs> you know what? You know I don't. Jack all the time that Jack ran, he never personally asked me to participate. Or you me. know. People around him may have, but I don't ever recall going out and campaigning for him. I went to a couple of his uh, functions and everything, but just to go out and beat the bushes and campaign for him and everything, he never asked that of us. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he didn't put that on us. It was all Rutkowski's fault. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was all Rutkowski's fault. He, 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 he had a great line. Uh, he said that uh, uh, he went out and he told the people of uh, uh, Western New York that if you didn't elect me to Congress, I might have to go back and play quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> he said, so that reassured my election. Well, did, did anybody ever campaign for him? No, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing. All of, our, uh, all of our wives did. They were the supporters that campaign headquarters and Mary Lou and Kem campaigners yeah yeah campaigners yeah. I mean the girls did Paul, but didn't, didn't two of his old teammates on the Chargers Ernie Ladd and Earl Face on campaign for they him? did you're absolutely right they did because uh, they were so glad to get him out of San Diego <laughs> <laughs> make sure he didn't have to come back to California <laughs> okay no, but they did yeah Larry, that's true Larry you're on the Hall of Fame Selection committee, right? Right. Okay. So, is there ever a chance that Jack Kemp will be in the Hall of Fame? Probably not. Uh, it's as tough as uh, as uh, 
Peter King from Sports Illustrated coined a, 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 a line several years ago that brought up every year at that meeting. Uh, he belongs, so-and-so belongs in the Hall of the Very Good, not the Hall of Fame. Uh, Billy Shaw actually has made a, made a petition to the Hall of Fame that there be a sort of a separate category yeah, for public service or, so. or something like that. Yeah. What, is there any chance of that? Honestly, no. I don't think so uh, because there's a long line of people who uh, are in that category who have not been elected. Uh, it's, not a, it's not easy to get in the Hall of Fame. Yep. And uh, that's why they have a seven-hour meeting every year, and people storm out. <coughs> They're quite angry at one another, and uh, it's, it's not easy to get in. Okay, I think we're uh, I think we've about uh, done it. But I just want to make give everybody an opportunity. If you have one thought about how Jack Kemp ought to be remembered, um, anybody want to conclude with? Well, I'd like to say okay. this. Uh, uh, I had a story of uh, that I wanted to tell, and it's leaving me. Oh, man. <laughs> Well, I'd like somebody else pick, pick it up, and then you'll remember. To me ten times a day for <laughs> I would like to say, if, uh, for a uh, uh, small kid, a little kid like me, came up from a town in Pennsylvania uh, as a football player. Um, uh, I was very, very, very lucky, and I'm very, very, very proud of saying I played with Jack Kemp. But there's not too many people can say that. You know, it really is kind of neat. It's it's hard to believe that, that we're sitting here and a guy that was so young and vibrant as Jack when he was real. And Jack uh, never aged, never uh, never stopped working, never stopped doing things, that he's not here. And I, that's a sad part. But what Jack gave to all of us, as you've heard, uh, what he's given to all of you and all of them and every endeavor that he's ever taken on, uh, he may not get to the Hall of Fame, Larry, and I agree with you totally. But with us, he is in the Hall of Fame. But I always recall uh, Jack is a great family man. I mean, I, I admire and respect him uh, tremendously. And in fact, uh, after the uh, championship game, uh, my vivid memory of uh, him is uh, being carried off the field, but he had his son, was it Jeff or Jimmy, on his shoulder. Uh, that exemplified uh, what he was all about. He was a family man first, and he loved his family. What, was Joanne sort of some kind of a den mother for the for the team? I mean, what, what was her role? She was the one who she's the glue that kept the Kemp family together. And, you know, because Jack had so many interests and was always going off on tangents, whether it's football or politics or whatever. You know, working for Goldwater, but. Uh, Joanne was the glue that kept the Kemp family she, together. She, she brought him back to earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd just like to say, Marty, yeah. that yeah. Uh, the things that I, I used to notice about Jack, <clears throat> for whatever reason, he had to come back to Buffalo, politics or whatever. Jack never forgot his teammates. He would always want a group of us to be there. And uh, I used to wonder sometime, I said, well, gee, Jack and I was spending more time talking about football than he did politics at times. But that was the way Jack was. He really wanted to uh, get us there to let people know that, uh, you know, we're still with Jack. We supported Jack whenever we could, whatever we could do. And uh, I just always appreciated Jack for being that kind of person. He was a people's person. Eddie. Now, to, uh, on, that, on the note of Charlie, that Charlie just made, this is what I wanted to say. Jack uh, used to come back and would invite some of his fellow teammates to lunch. And on one occasion, we all went to lunch. I think the Binion was there. I'm sure you were there on one of these occasions. And our son, who was in college at the time, was at home. And he wanted, we told him we were going to have lunch with Jack Kemp. And he said, oh, I want to meet Jack Kemp. I want to meet him. So we all go to lunch. And Jack mentioned to uh, my son that, you know, there's a young lady in our office back in Washington, she's nice looking, said, uh, boy, you, you should, you should uh, maybe you should, should meet her. And my son said, oh, that would be nice, Jack. 
but I don't know what my wife would say about that. <laughs> <laughs> we were never invited to lunch with Jack Kemp. Well, you weren't, yeah. huh? No. I when did you guys go to lunch with Jack Kemp? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> Ed didn't tell us about that one. <laughs> Well, that's true, right? Look, yeah. now you <laughs> <laughs> I vouch for it. Were you invited to that. lunch, Larry? You know, okay, on that note, I think we're, I, listen, this has been wonderful. <laughs> I think this is going to be, you know, provide such great memories for so many people and fans in Buffalo and also people who consult the Jack Kemp collection at the Library of Congress uh, or on the, the, uh, the Kemp Foundation website. So thank you all for participating in this, and thanks to you, Ed, for for organizing it. My pleasure. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, where's the, where's the we have lunch now.